नमस्कार एंड थैंक यू बैजयंती मैडम फॉर द इंट्रोडक्शन एंड थैंक यू टू यू टू प्रोफेसर अशोक मुखोपाध्याय फॉर दैट वेरी काइंड एंड लॉन्ग इंट्रोडक्शन टू आवर आश्रम एंड आवर वर्क दैट वी आर ट्राइंग टू डू वेल इट्स अ ग्रैंड ओकेशन फॉर ऑल ऑफ अस इज अ सेवेंटी फिफ्थ ईयर ऑफ इंडियन इंडिपेंडेंस इट इज ऑल्सो द टूडे इज ऑल्सो द वन हंड्रेड एंड फिफ्टी एथ बर्थ एनिवर्सरी ऑफ श्री अरबिंदो एंड दिस ईयर इज द हंड्रेड एंड ट्वेंटी फिफ्थ ईयर ऑफ नेताजी सुभाष चंद्र बोस सो दिस इज अ वेरी सिग्निफिकेंट मोमेंट इन आवर हिस्ट्री एज फार एज वी आर कंसर्न सो एज प्रोफेसर मुखोपाध्याय हैड टोल्ड मी दैट ही वुड लाइक मी टू गिव अ brief introduction to the uninitiated so it's actually a very huge topic this history behind the mystery and it it say it has got layers and layers of insights and every day new materials and new evidences are coming up so i'll try my best to confine within the introductory stage and uh, i would uh, start off by talking about the three commissions that uh, you talked about the shanawas commission the kosla commission and the mukherjee commission i will not go into the dull reports of these commissions i will add some insights and my observations and my readings of these commissions but before that uh, i would like to raise a question both to myself and to the august audience who is gathered here that what has changed in the last two decades what has really changed in the last 20 years that there seems to be a surge of interest around the disappearance of netaji subhash chandra bose during the 80s and 90s there was also lot of interest there were debates in parliament there were court cases but it had not really percolated among the public in a way that it has done now well to me two major changes have happened two things phenomenon i would like i like to say one is the social media the advent of the social media and number two is the rti revolution the right to information act now these have really empowered the people it's not only the followers and admirers of netaji subhash chandra bose who have doubted the theories many experts many scholars many writers many researchers and historians have always doubted the 1945 plane crash theory but they have not been able to really publicize their work they have there some of the I, i have known some of these researchers personally they are men of great integrity they they have dedicated their life to this research but they are not good at promoting themselves in the last 20 years the social media has really helped them to have a voice and it has really helped them to connect with each other that is that is how i have come across many of these stalwarts who have been completely shy of the media have stayed away from the camera have not tried to reveal themselves in front of the public but they know a lot they they have done really a lot of research on netaji and the right to information act has really empowered us many journalists of the present generation many young scholars have used this right to continuously ask for documents from the indian government from the central intelligence agencies from the military establishment from america from russia from england not that they have been given these documents but some documents have come out and uh, the government has also recently as you know in the last few years have also declassified some of these secret netaji files most of these uh, documents and files 
are of not much value. But some interesting details have come out. For example, I just give you one example. You are all aware of the fact that it has come out that the government of India had retained a surveillance on the whole of the Bose family till the 80s. About more than 50 members of the Bose family who are most of them well known. They are politically connected. Some of them are writers, teachers, professors, scientists spread across the whole world. The government had kept a close watch on their activities and movements. Their phone calls, their visits to foreign countries, their acquaintances, their meetings, everything has been monitored by intelligence agencies and directly reported to the PMO. Why? Why was the need to do so till the 80s when the official version is that Subhash Chandra Bose had died in a plane crash in 1945. So this RTI uh, act and this asking for documents has been a great boon to boost the, the, the Netaji uh, story in the last uh, two decades. Having said that, there is another thing that I would like to say. Why is it important? I will deal with this more and if there are questions from the audience, we will go more into the detail. But why in, in 2022 is it important to know for us what happened in 1945? Whether Netaji was alive or whether he died, how is it relevant in today's context, in the problems that we are facing today, in the global crisis, in the recession, in the wars and the conflicts? How is it important? Well, I think it is not only important, I think it is very urgent for us to know. Because for more than 100 years, we have been fed lies about our history, about our civilization, about our culture. And in the modern age, one of the greatest lies or the cover-up is the Nidhati Shivas Chandra story. Mind you, there have been other cover-ups also. For example, the death of Lal Bahadur Shastri the mysterious disappearance of Homi Bhava and some of his scientific colleagues, even the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi, it's a huge cover-up. If you study the case closely, you will see the death of uh, Mr. Indira Gandhi, the death of Rajiv Gandhi and numerous other death of many mysterious deaths of many ISRO scientists and the disappearance as soon as, was, as India was on the verge of uh, and making breakthroughs in nuclear research, in space research. See, all these lies and cover-ups are somehow tied to each other. And it is also tied to the fact that we need to know who we are and where we stand. So that, I think, is the, uh, the main pretext on which we will start our argument today. So as I, as I had promised that uh, we would start with the three commissions. We all know about the commissions more or less. But I hope I will be able to add a little, little tidbits of insights. Which may be uh, you know, revealing to some of us. The Shah Nawaz commission was set up in 1956. And due to pressure from uh, Netaji researchers and scholars, Netaji admirers that Pandit Nehru had to establish this commission. This commission had Shah Nawaz, who was a veteran of the INA, who had been tried in the Red Fort and exonerated. And there was a second man, his name was Esed Moitro. And there was a third person, he was Suresh Chandra Bose, a Shedzda of Shubhash Chandra Bose. So apparently, if you look at it, a very fair and very impartial commission board, Nobody can question it, but there is a little bit of a glitch here. Shah Nawaz, who was part of the British Indian Army before, in the beginning, and then he was a prisoner of war and he was stirred by the speeches of Netaji and then he joined the Azad Hind Fauj. And uh, after the trial, one one, that was, one is not aware of it, it is not very much publicized, he became a turncoat. 
he publicly professed that he has now discarded Netaji's ideas of independence. He had now adopted as his own Gandhiji's idea of non-violence and pacifism. And immediately, as soon as he made this confession, publicly, he was uh, made a parliamentary secretary. And ever since, he was a very important and a, and, a, and a senior member of the Indian National Congress till his death. He had been elected four times in the Lok Sabha from Meerut. Two times he was defeated. So that is one part of Shah Nawaz Khan, one story. Another story is, another part is that his own son had crossed over to Pakistan and had joined the Pakistan army and had fought for Pakistan against India during the Kashmir war. This is another story. So, and is also widely suspected that uh, he had been leaking information while being in the Azad Infos, while being in the Indian National Army, he had been leaking information to the British Secret Service to make them aware of what Netaji's plans were. So, in fact, Netaji had said that it's unfortunate that I had to be step that, that I had to step into someone else's shoes because the army was almost half formed when he had decided or when he had agreed to take over leadership of the army. So that is one. The Shah Nawaz Commission was given a brief. It's very important to know what that brief, brief was. The brief was that conduct an investigation, make it quick and do it in such a way that you will conclude that in 1945 Netaji had died in a plane crash. So that was his brief. He had nothing else to do. So from the very beginning, there was a clash between Shah Nawaz Khan and Suresh Chandra Bose. Because Suresh Chandra Bose found a lot of contradictions in the testimony of the witnesses. He was convinced that Subhash Bose was alive. In fact, Sharad Bose the elder brother of Shubhash Chandra Bose, he died in 1950. Till his death, Sharad Bose was convinced because Sharad Bose is an important, uh, important uh, member here, an important personality here. Because during nine, the 40s, Sharad Bose was as powerful in the Congress as Gandhi was. So, Sharad Bose had a very big role in the Congress, number one. Number two, he is the only person in the family whom Netaji trusted completely and confided everything. So, if Netaji was alive after 1945, if, 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 he had, if he had liked to contact anybody, it would be Sharad Bosch. Till 1950, when Sharad Bosch died, he was convinced, in fact, he had said in an interview that Shubash is alive and is in Red China. That was Sharad Bosch. And Suresh Bose also had information that Shubhash Bose was alive. So he wanted a more impartial investigation into the matter. But unfortunately, that there was a lot of clash between Shah Nawaz Khan and Suresh Chandra Bose. Finally, the commission ended the investigations and the report was duly submitted, but it was signed by only two of the members of the commission, Suresh Chandra Bose did not agree to sign the commission and the, the report. In fact, as you are well aware, he prepared a dissension report. He, it was his own observations regarding the case. He was convinced that Shubhash Bosch had not died in the plane crash. And now another, another this is, these are interesting insights. This, this will reveal the mystery also. Dr. Bidan Chandra Roy called him. Bidan Chandra Roy was at that time the Chief Minister of West Bengal. Bidan Chandra Roy called Suresh Chandra Bose and said rather angrily that what's wrong with you? Why don't you sign the, the Shah Nawaz Commission report? So Suresh Chandra Bose said that because I am convinced that Shubhash is alive. How do you know? What proof do you have? He said. And then Suresh Chandra Bose retorted. He said, what proof do you have? that he is dead. 
Then Vidhan Chandra Rai almost, you know, tried to bribe him in an indirect way that I will make you a governor of two states if you agree to sign this report. And Suresh Chandra Bose refused. And he said that I am preparing a dissension report. Dr. B.C. Roy said, who will publish this report? Suresh Chandra Bose said, I will find a publisher. Dr. Roy said, you won't find anyone. I will I'll ensure that you do not find a publisher. So finally, he did not find a publisher. He had to spend his own money. He was not very rich, unlike other uh, members of the Bose family. So he had to uh, you know, find his own resources and publish a few copies of the dissension report. So this is the first Shanawas Commission report that said that Shubhash Chandra Bose had died in the plane crash in, uh, near, near Taipei in Taiwan. Then obviously the debate continued. People were not convinced and again in 1970 a second commission was established under Mrs. Indira Gandhi and this commission was headed by G.D. Khosla. G.D. Khosla is another very interesting person. He was the Chief Justice of India at one time and as you are probably aware that he is the man who had, uh, who was the judge of Nathuram Gotse trial. In fact, he had written a book on that uh, particular trial, on particular case. G.D. Khosla was an Anglophile. He loved wearing ties and jackets and uh, special dress for dinner, special dress for lunch, special dress for morning walks and all that. He was a nice and he knew Shubhash Bosch personally, but I'll come to that later. He was a very close friend of Pandit Nehru. They used to play golf together in, the, in these uh, summer resorts in the mountains. Uh, Nehru used to write preludes for his books and he used to write introductions of Nehru's books. G.D. Khosla also wrote the biography of Indira Gandhi. I think all these details are very important. You know? I won't, I'm not commenting, I'm just I'm giving out you these details. And uh, he was uh, ICS two years or three years senior to Shubhash Bosch. They had not really talked with each other, but there was an uh, incident in which Shubhash Bosch in, 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 the, in, in, in England, in the university, he was talking to some of his friends and giving out his patriotic ideals, explaining to them that why he would not take up a job after completing the ICS. And then G.D. Khosla was there and he remarked, and he had remarked that he would like to join the administrative services because that is the way to serve his country. And then Shubhash Bose had given him a look, a look of such disdain and disgust that Khosla had never forgotten that look. In fact, he had written in his book that that look had remained with him uh, like a guilt conscience. So all this is very important to understand how biased he was against Shubhash Bose. And in that report, after the, uh, the, the investigations were complete and he had satisfied the brief of Mrs. Gandhi, in that report, he sort of blurted out these personal grudges and the biases that he had against Shubhash. He used the words like he was extremely hot-headed and temperamental and uh, outrageous and he has surrendered to the to these Japanese colonialists and all these things he wrote about Shubhash Bosch in his report and he came to the same conclusion that 1945 the plane crash Shubhash was dead etc etc and the ashes of the body were in Renkoji temple in Tokyo in Japan. Now these two commission and these two reports did not satisfy many of the scholars and historians and political personalities during that time. In fact, after the emergency, when there was a new government in India, a kind of a coalition government of Janata Dal under Mr. Moraji Desai, again people like Shamor Goho 
and others, they raised these issues in the parliament and there was a huge debate and very nice good debate there. I would like to read out to you what the then Prime Minister of India, Mr. Moradi Desai had said on the floor of the parliament in 1978 in reply to this debate. He said, the majority report of the first committee and Sri Khosla held the report of the death as true. Since then, reasonable doubts have been cast on the correctness of the conclusions reached in the two reports and various important contradictions in the testimony of witnesses have been noticed. Some further temporary official documentary records have also become available. In the light of those doubts and contradictions and those records, government find it difficult to accept that the earlier conclusions are decisive. So it's uh, from the Prime Minister of India in 1978 that was a point blank dismissal of the two commission reports. So naturally, the third commission was due in 1978, but unfortunately, the government fell and again Indira Gandhi and the Congress party came back to power and so the process was delayed by another 20 years. And then a writ petition from the Calcutta High Court made the government decide to have a third commission in 1999. Under the India government, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, India government, 1999, a third commission was established, one man commission, the Mukherjee Commission, Justice Mukherjee Commission. Monoj Kumar Mukherjee, he was a retired judge of the Supreme Court, a man of impeccable integrity, honesty and devotion. And especially his personal, you know, devotion to Nidaji Shivas Chandra Bose is significant in this case. So he was asked to complete the investigations in six months and he was given a more exhaustive brief. The brief given to Mukherjee Commission is very important. It said, for number one, did Nitari Shivas Chandra die in a plane crash? Number two, are the ashes in the Renkoji temple the ashes of Nitari Shivas Chandra Bose? Number three, if he did not die in the plane crash, where did he go? Number four, is Nitari Shivas Chandra Bose still alive? Number five, if he is still alive, where is he? What about his whereabouts? So these are the five questions that were put to him as part of the brief and he was asked to complete the investigations in six months. It took six years for him to complete the investigation because he said that the, the volume of the task is so big and one had to travel to many countries to find answers to some of the questions. So it was impossible to come up with a report within six months. And number two, total non-cooperation from the government, both from the India government and subsequently from the UPA government of Dr. Monmohan Singh and our Home Minister at that time, Shivraj Pati, complete non-cooperation. Because a commission in order to conduct inquiries needs papers, needs documents, needs information. So they were the whole time they were busy trying to get some documents out from the government and the government was giving uh, busy denying them. 90% of the documents asked for were refused to them. In fact, even when Justice Mukherjee Commission wanted to go to Russia, permission was not granted to them. Because Justice Mukherjee was convinced that Netaji, who had not died in the plane crash, had crossed over to Russia from Manchuria. So, subsequently what happened in the late 40s and the early 50s, is something that only the Russian KGB will be able to tell us. So after repeated wrangling and even this was a big issue in the parliament and lot of string pulling 
and the government refusing, finally the government allowed the Mukherjee Commission to go to Moscow. But the Mukherjee Commission members, as soon as they arrived in Moscow, as soon as they landed there, when they talked with the first official, they realized that the Indian government had instructed the Russian government not to reveal a single bit of information about Bose to the Mukherjee Commission. So why this hush up? Anyway, finally, after six long years, after Shivraj Patil had started behaving rather rudely with Justice Mukherjee, he was a very senior judge and a man respected by one and all, who had taken, as you know, only one rupee as honorarium per month for his service uh, in this commission, Justice Mukherjee Commission finally submitted its report. And it said in that report, unambiguously, that Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose did not die in the plane crash. In fact, there was no plane crash in Taihoku airport from their logbooks in the month of August. Not only that, even in the month of July, even in the month of September, October, November, there has been no report of any plane crash whatsoever. So, in fact, it was a camouflage created by Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose himself in order to hoodwink the Allied forces and take shelter in a place where he found it to be secured. Number two, he had gone to Manchuria and had probably crossed over to Soviet Russia at that time and he was probably held by um, Stalin's uh, people and we don't really know or rather Mukherjee Commission said we don't really know what really happened after that. Third, whether he is dead, the commission said yes he is dead. How? By the law of averages. By, by 2006, when the report was being given to the government, Netaji would be around uh, more than 100 years old, 109 years old in fact. So by the law of averages, Mukherjee said that he is probably dead. And about his whereabouts, well, it is unknown and it is the, the suggestion of the commission was to the government that government would should set up a new commission to find out what happened to Netaji after 1945. In the meantime, as you know, as everybody knows, there were other stories that were circulating in the media everywhere about one sannyasi or the other. They are not only about one Gumnai Baba in Uttar Pradesh, but you also know about Sholmari Baba, also one sannyasi in the south of India. So, Mukherjee Commission had pursued some of these stories and the one story that they pursued very seriously, a lot of, with great uh, detail, exhaustively, is the story of Gumnai Baba in Uttar Pradesh. But let me, let me tell you first that uh, this monk's name is not Gumnami. The name Gumnami has, had been given by the journalists of Uttar Pradesh after 1985 when they came to know about this monk after he had disappeared. According to some people, after he died in 1985, September 16th. But according to others, he had disappeared. So anyway, so they, the journalists gave the name Gumnami. The meaning is one whose name is lost, who does not have a name anymore. But the local uh, people, the local devotees who came to him, they used to call him mostly Bhagavanji. And some people used to call, call him Pardewala Baba. Whether he had a sannyas name, nobody is really sure about that. But from one letter that was written to this Bhagavanji, we have come to know that probably his sannyas name was Shami Vijayananda. Whatever that may be, but this is one person on whom the Mukherjee Commission made 
a detailed investigation and a few teeth were found in his possession after this man had gone away in that in that house in that room in Ram Bhavan and many handwriting specimens where he had written letters or made some notes in books where he had drawn some maps and mentions names mention names of pages so Mukherjee Commission had used the government agencies forensic experts and handwriting experts to check to get them genetically tested the teeth and to check the handwritings of this monk with the handwriting of Nidhi Shubhash Chandra Bose. In both the cases, the agencies had given a reply that they are that they do not match. But remember, these are government agencies. From uh, non-governmental agencies, both for in India and abroad, at least on the handwriting part, there have been reports by experts that due to aging our handwritings do change if you give leeway to that then they belong to one and the same person almost sure of that this is something that Bilal had said in his uh, uh, in his uh, report unofficially I mean in a in a private uh, investigation conducted under the uh, request of journalists from Times of India so anyway however so he had pursued that uh, investigation and he had written in the report that due to a lack of clinching evidence these are the exact words he had used in the report due to lack of clinching evidence it can be cannot be said whether this Bhagavanji or Gumnai Baba was Nitaji Shubhash Chandra Bose however probably you are aware of the fact that there is one documentary on this disappearance it is called the black box of history it is available in the public domain you can uh, watch the documentary it has been made by Omlan Kushum Ghosh another very dedicated researcher of Nitaji Shubhash Chandra Bose in which he had taken a detailed interview of Monoj Mukherjee and about his findings uh, uh, of uh, the plane crash and also about his findings on this mysterious monk in Uttar Pradesh and in one careless moment when uh, Mukherjee, Manoj Mukherjee thought that the camera was off and he said that this is off the record, please don't quote me, please don't use this footage, but I am sure 100% that he was Nitaji. Now this is very important because Justice Mukherjee is not an emotional person, he is a retired judge of the Supreme Court. So when he says that personally he was sure that this man was Netaji, this man means Bhagavanji and he was alive definitely till 1985 and when he had said that and that footage is available in black box of his history, uh, the director Amlan Kushum Ghosh had not kept his word, he had used that footage and it became a sensation, it went viral after that. So there is some substance in that, so when he is saying it. So, when this report was submitted to the government, what is the government supposed to do? They have to, they have to take action on that report. It was submitted in, I think, in May, in the month of May in 2005. And in 2006, this report was tabled in the parliament. And after just half an hour of cursory remarks, Shivraj Patil dismissed the report. Because it has come to the conclusion that Shubhash Chandra Bose did not die in the plane crash. There was no debate, there was no attempt to analyze the whole report, there was no attempt to, to analyze or to discriminate or to try and weigh the pros and cons of the cases, nothing. It, it merited a discussion for at least three days after six years of hard work. It took half an hour for, uh, for an arrogant home minister to completely dismiss the report and it was you know they taken off the table so that is the, the 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 history of the three commissions and their reports so this is my introduction you know about the three reports and that is why it is very important to know what exactly had happened uh, in 1945 and what happened after that 
and why is the government silent on this issue we all know that the official version is 1945 plane crash but actually nobody in the government if you, even if it is a Congress government or the BGP government or whatever, nobody in the government seriously believes the story themselves. And why, for example, a few years back, when Mr. Arun Jaitley was asked by the press that why are they not revealing all the documents about Netaji? And he said that it will you know, harm our relationships with, our, with some of our friendly countries. Why did he say that? What is, the, what is the meaning, what is the significance of such a statement? You see a lot of things happened in the Second World War. You know what atrocities Germany had committed. And yet everybody is now in a friendly uh, uh, relationship with Germany. We know what Japan had did. We know all the story. And yet everybody is everybody's friend in modern uh, international politics. So which countries was... Mr. Jaitley talking about. So everybody I think in the government, at least the higher ups, I think in the intelligence bureaus, I think in the defense ministry, many most of the people even among senior journalists, most people know that he did not die in the plane crash because there was no plane crash. But why this hush hush? This is more important rather than the plane crash or rather than the fact that Netaji may not have died in 1945. What is more important is the desperate attempt by the government of India and by many other forces and some many foreign forces are also involved in this to keep the matter under the carpet. Number one. Number two is there are certain other things that I want to talk about. For example, Many people ask me or ask people are constantly saying this. If he was alive after 1945, why did he not come back to India as himself? I mean, he did <laughs> according to the people who believe in the Bhagavanji theory or the Gumnami Baba theory. He did come back to India. Not only that, he stayed for at least 30 years incognito. But why did he not come back to India as himself? as Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. The simple answer to this is war criminal. Now, was he a war criminal? Is the name of Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose in the list of a war criminal? So far, there is no official record in existence that says that he was. Having said that, so far, there is no official record saying that he was not a war criminal. That is also very important. When Shashi Tharoor was working in the UNO, some journalists and researchers had personally asked him, had written to him, telling him that please find out from the archives of the United Nations whether Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose's name is in the list of war criminals. And he after some research or some attempts, he wrote back saying that it is impossible for us now, that for the present crop of the United Nations officials, to access these documents about the status of war criminals. So, there is no official uh, by, you know, denial also of the fact that he was a war criminal. Number two, as you know, probably, probably you know, that Jawaharlal Nehru in a, in a kind of a fit of uh, emotion or anger had dictated, no, dictated a note for a stenographer to type. And the name of the stenographer was Shamlal Join. And in that note, it, this is something that Join had said to G.D. Khosla in the Khosla Commission. He had said, that the note was addressed to Clement Attlee, who was the Prime Minister of Britain when India was getting independence, 1947. And he said that your war criminal is now in Russia under Stalin's protection. And how dare Stalin keep him? He should hand him, he should hand him over to you, that is the Allied forces, to, 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 to Britain, to be tried in a case. So, this is another uh, important uh, uh, clue 
the fact that he may have been a war criminal and if he was a war criminal then it is impossible for him to come back in the country then the because we are still a commonwealth country and in the 50s immediately after the transfer of power of 1947 India was more or less under the MI6 and there are numerous instances of that that is the military intelligence 6 of the British uh, domestic surveillance system so in there were compulsions and there is there are records there is a document that Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose had made at least three broadcasts at least three broadcasts after August 1945 two broadcasts in December and the third broadcast in February 46 and all these broadcasts were from Moscow broadcast to the people of India and he had said in these broadcasts that I am safe and I will return to India as soon as possible. A third world war is going to begin any time soon and as soon as it starts it will be the right time for me to return to my motherland. Now what is the significance of the third world war? The significance is that as soon as a third world war starts the war criminal status of the first and the second world war becomes nullified. Then you become again free. Then again the, the balance of powers are again changing. The equilibriums are changing again. It's, a, it's an another chaos till the end of the third world war until one sees who are the victors and who are the demolished etc etc and the new sets and new uh, 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 guidelines will come into being. So, all keeping all this in mind, India was probably under a compulsion that if Netaji was uh, had come back, then the Indian government would have no option, in spite of all the public sentiment, but have no option but to hand him over to the masters. The there is also a lot of doubt about the transfer of power agreement that took place between the Indian officials and the British officials. There, most of these documents, huge volumes of documents of transfer of power are still top secret. They are classified. So, being a commonwealth country, under these obligations, when a disastrous partition had happened, and when the, the eyes of the media, or you can say the government or the British spy agencies, the surveillance were completely on his movements. So I think it was not possible for him, Nidhi Shubhash Chandra Bose, to return to India as himself. And it is very important to understand that. Uh, because, and there also have been, if you assume for example, that Bhagavanji was Nidhi Shubhash Chandra Bose, there have been numerous instances when his followers, his friends, his devotees had asked him to come out in the open and each time he had said that the country will burn if I do that. It will be disastrous. The time is not yet ripe. He had said that. Number one. Number two, many people ask this question, raise this question to us that how can a political person like Nidhari Shubhash Chandra Bose become a monk and hide in a forest. He, he was never a coward like this. These are very simplistic, moronic kind of arguments. Think of it, I think we should think of it in a sense of strategy. Let us try to understand the strategy because Shubhash Chandra Bose, if you follow his life very closely from his childhood till at least 1945, you will realize one thing that he was not an emotional revolutionary. He was just not one of those ambitious careerist politicians. He was a master strategist and he wanted his colleagues in, in political circles to have that kind of strategy, the sense of strategy, like, like a strategy like a Chanukya or a strategy like a Krishna in Mahabharata war. You see, he wanted that. He believed in uh, kind of a, a, the fact that a soldier is 
also a seer, a true soldier is also a rishi, a seer. He is just not an emotional person, bundled, was just ready to die for his country. Dying is not important. Defeating the enemy is important. And find out ways to defeat. So he was a master strategist. Think of it. Uh, the two atom bombs had dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The INA is defeated. So where will Netaji go? And how will he go? He cannot go to take refuge in uh, one of these allied countries because he is the enemy number one. Remember, when the war, the theater of the war shifted from Europe to Asia, that is when Netaji Shubhashtrandra Bose came by submarine from Berlin to Southeast Asia. Then he was not deemed to be only a freedom fighter of India. He was considered to be a liberator of Asia. That is why in many of the correspondences between British officials, they referred to him as the enemy number one. The war in Europe had ended. Now the war was going on in Asia and he was the main enemy for them. So when he is cornered, when the INA is defeated, where will he go? None of these countries will give him shelter, not even the US. And the countries who were friendly to him, for against Japan, Japan, for example, Japan, Japan was completely devastated. Germany was devastated. Italy, no chance. So where will he go? In fact, his only option was Russia. In fact, he had been thinking about Russia one year back because he had, he had foreseen, he had realized the moment uh, Hitler decided to attack Russia, he knew the war was over for Hitler. In fact, he had warned at that time that this is a big blunder that Hitler is making by attacking, by trying to attack Russia. So, the only place was Russia. Mind you, Though Russia had joined the Allied forces reluctantly towards the end of the war, Russia was no friend of Britain ever. Neither was Russia a friend of the US. And remember also, it is, there is also a very important personal thing about Stalin. He disliked Nehru. Stalin disliked Nehru. That, that is why till 1953, Nehru did not once go to the Soviet Russia. Because Stalin did not want him to come. Number two, Stalin did not even believe that India was free even in 1950. He had told this to some of his communist friends from Bengal who had come to uh, visit him. He had told this to them that I don't believe that you are free. You have got any freedom from the British. He disliked Nehru completely. So this was, this would be a big, you know, sort of a satisfaction for him to hide or to shelter or to protect the one person Nehru really feared in his political life. That is Shubhash Chandra Bose. So that is why there was a big possibility that Russia would be the place for him to take refuge. Number one. Number two also let me add that after the INA was defeated, Netaji had told his associates in the Azadin Fauj that he would surrender himself to the British. Why? It was also a strategy. It was not an emotional decision. He said that way the whole country will be galvanized against the British. They would be struck so heavily by the shock of the fact that I have surrendered myself and the British are ready to kill me. That the whole country would rise up against the British. That is the only way. But his friends in the, in the Ajadin Fauj managed to convince him that this is not the way. There are other ways also. We need you. We can again build up an army and build up a resistance against the British. So he had decided something on which he was planning to do for more than one year. That is switch over to Russia. And that is one reason why he chose Russia. There was no other place for him to go. And then 
also stalin had said to his friends from india especially from bengal to the some of the comrades he had told that bose is not secure will not be secure after i die so we will man will have to arrange we will have to sort of try and arrange for a safe passage for him back to india now these are all these are all in the public domain these all these conversations all these interactions you have to go only deep and do some research to find this out i am not making it uh, making it up there is a there, there are there is a school of scholars in india and name i'll name them dr purubi rai dr subramaniam swami dr colonel g g bakshi who say that netaji was killed by the russians under stalin's regime they are fixed on this idea they say that he was not killed in the plane crash that there was no plane crash okay agreed but he was killed in russia somehow they completely deny the possibility of netaji having returned to india there is some kind of a game here going on even even among the scholars there is one group of scholars not many one group of scholars the official version of government and the some of the key members of the bose family especially the mother son combination krishna bose and sugata bose they and people who are close to them they are screaming over the rooftop they are still sitting in the plane uh, in the plane that got crashed they imagine the plane so there is one school of thought with the plane crash second school of thought that kills uh, shubhash chandra bose in russia third school of thought is the gumnai baba theory that he came back to india and stayed in uttar pradesh and died in 1985 in faizabad that is a 16th of september third school there is a fourth school of thought which says that he did not die that was his third camouflage game that he played the first game being when he escaped from elgin road the second game was was when he created the camouflage of the plane crash and the third was when he disappeared as gumnami baba from faizabad somebody else someone else whose face was covered was burned in his place some other dead body so that is a that is a fourth theory that he survived and is doing some special sadhana and he will return any day to you know rescue india from this great difficulty and all that so this is the fourth uh, theory so the, all these theories are there so more or less i have tried to give you an introduction one more thing that why did he become a monk that is another standard you know question that people ask a man like netaji a great political figure a great military figure why should he become a monk why should he become a baba they they talk about monks and babas in a very derogatory sort of way as if becoming a monk monk means a failure in life as if monkhood is an escapism as somebody who becomes monk is now is fed up of life and has given up life and gone away from life these nonsense ideas indians still have about a, a community that is very much part of so much so integral part of indian culture so this is very important to understand that when if for example if netaji decided to come back to india in a disguise not as netaji the monk is the best guard for him is a best dress for him because nobody inquires from a monk where were you born where where did you spend your childhood we say that don't ask him about his previous life a monk can spend his days in 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 india in a temple in the in the woods uh, in a village in a city he could be sitting under a, in, in in a station nobody would look back at him a monk would be able to travel in trains and nobody would come and ask for a ticket so uh, it is very easy for a monk to move around freely in india nowhere else in the world in at least the developed world do you have such monks who can move around freely and they not only move around freely 
they get arms and gifts from people. People feed them. People clothe them. People give them some money. People to pronoun to them. So another, if you look at it from a strategic point of view, when a person like Netaji wants to keep himself slightly behind the curtains, when he wants to avoid the public glare, at the same time be in some sort of communication with the people he wants to, then being a monk is the most practical thing to do. It, 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 it offers him some great opportunities to meet people from all walks of life. Number three and the most important uh, point which even many Netaji, so-called Netaji admirers tend to overlook is the spiritual side of Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, the man. If you want to know more about that, you should read a book written by his childhood friend Hemant Sharkar. Shubhash is 12 years with Shubhash. How deeply spiritual he was. What a great seeker he was within himself. He had run away from his home a couple of times in order to become a sannyas. He had done a lot of sadhana in his early years. And also you know that he had, he had his life changed, his life transformed. When he first started reading the books of Swami Vivekananda, he had written it himself. At 15, when I started reading Vivekananda, a huge transformation took place within him. Because finally he found a kind of a meeting ground between his spiritual quest and his ideal for his motherland, his political life. He found a meeting ground where, where life is embracing the problems of the country. Where life is not running away. And it, it, is, it, is, it is at that time, at, when he was now 18 years old, when he wrote to Hemant Sharkar that I feel a kind of a mission within myself. Look at the language of this man. I feel a mission within myself. I have to become the embodiment of the past, a product of the present and a prophet of the future. This is an 18 year old talking. Just not a political person who wants to be the Prime Minister of India. This is a visionary. And he's laying out, a chalking out, a plan for himself. And it is not something that he's thinking intellectually. It is something that is rising from within him. He was a deeply, deeply spiritual person. Read some of the letters that he had written to Dilip Kumar Rai. The son of D.L. Rai, who was a disciple of Sri Aurobindo. And you will see how much, how deeply he's thinking about mantra. The power of the, 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 the sound of mantra. How deeply he is trying to meditate. How deeply he is thinking about the role of dharma in the cultural awakening of uh, the Indian ethos. And how it is different from the western system of education. And what needs to be changed administratively, politically, educationally when India gets freedom. He is thinking at a very young age. Also, you will be surprised to know that even when he is the supreme commander of the Ajadin Foj, he is uh, every night he goes off to the Ramakrishna mission and he uh, takes out, uh, takes away his, uh, his military clothes and wears a dhoti and holds a mala and sits in the prayer room, the meditation room and does meditation or chanting or whatever for two hours. Read some of the recollections of some of his close associates in Ajadin Foz who said that while he was with us, he was also away from us. He was in some other world. A very silent and introspective person who was constantly trying to sort of dig, searching within himself. So, and there are numerous other instances, the way he came and met Baudachara Mujumdar and the way he met Anandamoyi Imam. There are many, many other instances of his sadhana, of his spiritual quest. So, if he had not become a political person, he would have definitely become a sannyasi. It is something that he had told his friend Dilip Kumar Rai many times. Dilip Rai had in insisted, why don't you come to Pondicherry? Enough of politics, this is... You are not a political person. You are a very talented man. You are a spiritual person. Why don't you come to Pondicherry? 
Dilip Kumar Rai had always said and he and Shubhash Bose had always replied that look I want to but I know if I go maybe I won't come back but I have a commitment to my motherland. So this is my response to those people who say how can a person like Shubhash Bose, a political figure like Shubhash Bose become a monk. So first reason is a strategy. He needed to keep himself hidden. And the second reason that a monkhood was ingrained in him. He was within himself a kind of a sannyasi. Even in his, even in his at home. Though he loved to eat, he loved to dress. At the same time, he was not really attached in the way worldly people are. He was in his own world, always focusing, always concentrating, always organizing, always planning. And now, I mean, this is a, some, of, some kind of an introduction. I've been talking for maybe more than one hour. So, uh, but there is another question that maybe if people want to ask questions, I, I, I can respond to that about did he remain completely obscure while he was in India, Bhagavanji, that is I meant, uh, I mean Bhagavanji, or did he play a role in some of the key events in the world, in globally? For example, in the escape of Dalai Lama from Tibet, for example, the 1971 war in Bangladesh and Bang when Bangladesh became free, for example, the war in Vietnam, and numerous other instances, international events, national events, because Bhagavanji, one thing I have realized that everybody knew about Bhagavanji. Important politicians knew about Bhagavanji. Important administrative officials knew about Bhagavanji. Top military officials in India knew about Bhagavanji. Only two segments of the country did not know about Bhagavanji while he was there till 1985. One, the media. Number two, the public. Everybody else who mattered knew. Among the political figures who went and met him and talked with him, five of them were later were the chief minister of Uttar, chief ministers of Uttar Pradesh. For example, Chaudhary Charan Singh, Kamalesh Pati Tripathi, Vinarasi Das, Sampurnanand, there's uh, people like that and many others. Military jeeps used to come to his house with the Indian flag uh, uh, fixed to the car in the, uh, at 2 o'clock, 1.30 in the night to have meetings with him for two hours. Letters used to come to him from all across the world. Little children from the villages used to collect the, uh, collect the uh, international stamps from his, from his envelopes. He used to burn hundreds and hundreds of these documents and letters every night. People have seen him doing that. He used to light a fire and burn these documents. And yet there are few documents he did not burn, which were later you know, studied and investigated by the Mukherjee Commission and other research institutes. So all these things, even our own Prabhupada Mukherjee had gone and visited him. So all these things are very important uh, to be discussed. These, they need to be discussed. They need to be understood. And all these things are coming out. So anyway, so there are still, if uh, you want, there we can talk a lot more about these things. If there is any question, uh, I'm, I'm free to answer them.